Good morning, everybody. So good to see you. Tim Alderson, known as Swanee, is uh, an expert on horses and horsemanship. And over the years of our acquaintance, Tim has taught me a lot about riding. Uh, one morning, he, he taught me even more than I think he meant to. One morning, uh, we went out very early to check on fences. Probably 5 a.m., I went out and got my favorite mount, Sam. Uh, he was a dappled gelding, and I, and I brought him in. And Sam didn't mind uh, at 5 a.m. being brought in. He didn't mind getting a treat. He didn't even mind being saddled as we got ready to go ride. But as soon as I asked Sam to move at anything faster than a very slow walk, he became quite petulant. Uh, in fact, Sam began to, uh, began to shudder at me. If you've ridden much, it's, it's not really a buck, but it's a persistent twitching of the head that lets the rider know the horse is very displeased, right? These fences were a long way off. We had to get done and get back because I had other things to do after sunrise. And so I just dug my heels in. I squeezed Sam and dug my heels in until finally he got up to a canter and we at last got done what we needed to get done. But neither of us was very happy about it. Uh, when we got back to the, the corral, we put the horses in the corral and then the adult, the humans, the adults, I think of the horses as children, um, the humans, we went, uh, we went into Tim's cabin. Tim, this is the main reason you wanted to work with Tim in the morning. Tim had a bacon recipe that he's never shared with me, but he did some kind of seasoning to it and he would cook it and then he would put it in the oven and bake it for a long time in maple syrup. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was worth 5 a.m. rides. So, so we're sitting and eating bacon and whatever else, and um, all that mattered was the bacon. And, and Tim looked at me and he said, hey, Drano, that was my camp name. So when he said, hey, Drano, why didn't you put on any spurs today? And in a rather noble voice, I said, well, I, I didn't want to hurt the horse. I didn't want to harm Sam. And Tim thought about that. He does everything very thoughtfully. And he said something very profound. In fact, it was so moving that I went back to my cabin afterwards and I wrote it down in my journal. Here's what Tim said. He said, Wayne, you must help the horse when he's sluggish or terrified. Do not harm the horse or act in anger, or, since that will make him lose respect for you. But do spur him on when he needs it, because no horse can be productive without guidance. Close quote. Now, I've thought a great deal about that comment, especially as I continue to grow up in Jesus Christ. And, I, and, I, and I'm amazed at how applicable that is to so many relationships in life with my accountability partners, my wife, or our children, coworkers, professors, students. Just, just think of it. Think of it like this. You must help that friend when he's sluggish or terrified. Do not harm the child or act in anger since that will make him lose respect for you. But do spur him on when he needs it because no student can be productive without guidance. Do you see? Now, Tim didn't create this idea. What he did, I realized later, is he had just absorbed and, and then applied this statement from the New Testament book of Hebrews. I'd like you to read with me Hebrews chapter 10. Join me on the underlined parts of, of verses 24 and 25. Hebrews 10. And let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. Uh, by the way, in Hebrews, the day is always talking about the return of Jesus Christ. As we point out in your notes there uh, online, if you're with us online, we're so thrilled to be with you. You should have a link from your, uh, your host here in the auditorium. You've got uh, bullets and open it up and you'll see there that Hebrews 10 declares that the need for spurring goes far beyond horses. Humans require activation as much, I would say more, than horses do. And while there has always been a need for spurs among humans, it may be as acute today as it has ever been. About Thanksgiving last year, uh, three big institutions, the Wheatley Foundation, the Institute for Family Studies, and the American Enterprise Institute issued this report, Family Formation in Post-COVID-19 America. It's a very telling study done on a great deal of evidence and research, and I think I think the analysis is perceptive. Uh, let me just share with you a part of the analysis. This is from one of the authors, uh, Yuval uh, Levin, and he says this, we are observing a disordered passivity. Wow, that's well said. Disordered passivity. A failure to launch, which leaves too many Americans on the sidelines of life. The rising generation is acutely averse to risk, and so to every form of dynamism, 
Americans are walking on eggshells around each other in many of our major institutions as speech and conduct codes stifle the public arena. Those speech and conduct codes tell us how to not behave without showing us how to thrive. He goes on. Through social media, we display ourselves without really connecting. Many people have become functional loners. We have to make a deeper, warmer argument, a case against giving up to persuade human beings to overcome passivity and paralysis and jump into life. All God's people said, in other words, we need to spur each other on. Look at this. Look again at Hebrews 10. 2,000 years ago, God provided the exact solution for what he knew would be our present need. Re read it with me again. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. Isn't that amazing? Now, open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10, if you would, and let's examine how God's call for spurring occurs in context. Let's get the context of what we just read. The thought section actually, be I know the context is important. It begins up in verse 19. Go to verse 19, if you would, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, which begins this way, sorry. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. By the way, sanctuary there is not talking about a physical building at all. Uh, sanctuary is talking about the very presence of God. The, the, this miraculous thing that, that almighty God, you can actually be in his presence because of what Jesus has done. That's the, the miracle here. All right. Since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he's inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful." And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting together together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I want you to notice the, the aspects of your character that are listed here. If, if, you, if you happen to be a believer in Jesus as your Savior, this passage is very deeply describing who you are. Look, th this is who you are. Look, you are siblings you can't choose your family. You're, you're, you're siblings. That's why he says you're all part of God's household, God's family, right? And we're to be bold. Did you catch that? Bold in drawing near to the Father. Isn't that incredible? We are children of God, called and such we are. As Charles Wesley would write in a famous hymn, bold we approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ our own. We are priests. That's why he mentions the high priest Jesus, because if you believe in Jesus, you're actually a priest. We can live, we can, by God's pure provision, we can live with consciences that are clean. We can, we can live holiness in sanctified lives. And, and because of Jesus' faithfulness, because he who called is faithful, we can live undaunted lives. Now, verses 24 and 25 contain the so what, right? Okay, all those things are true of us because of Jesus, right? So what do we do in response? How do we then live? We consider we think about each other and the march of God's plan. We think about each other and the, the, all the more as the day approaching. So we think about that in order to spur four things. Love, good deeds, assembling together, and encouragement. And the key word for all this is paroxysmos. The, the word we translate provoke or, or stir or spur. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an old term that actually originally meant to poke someone with a sharp stick. Um, it, it, it means to be a catalyst. Now, paroxysmos is a very forceful word. In fact, it is just over the line of being rude. It's a rude word. Outside the Bible, it, it, the verb almost always means something negative, to, to irritate, to incense, to provoke. Now, inside the Bible, paroxysmos only appears three other times in all the New Testament, and each of them is negative in tone. Each of the others is negative. For, uh, for example, Acts chapter 17, when the apostle Paul is in Athens, he is paroxysmos, he is incensed as he looks at all the nonsense of this foolish pagan city in front of him. Paroxysmos, that's what it means. All right, but here in Hebrews, this is so cool. This negative term is turned on its head. The author purposefully uses this word to catch our attention. God wants to stress that, that being activated 
It can feel like being poked by a sharp stick. It can, it can feel like being jabbed with spurs, but it is for good. The incomparable Frederick Remington captured this moment, uh, I think, as well as anyone ever has. 1902 masterpiece of his called The Cowboy. Um, if you know anything about riding, you know that, uh, that steep slopes are dangerous for horses and rocks are especially dangerous. Remington captured a moment. Look at all the rocks here that could easily break the, the legs of the horse. And, and this horse is running. He, look at the speed. You can just feel the speed. The guy was amazing. So this horse is going downhill and this cowboy is saving its life. He has spurred the horse. He's pulling on the reins to the left. And kind of like how many of you have ever snow skied? Okay, when you're on a really steep slope and you traverse across the side of the grain to, to maintain your speed and stay safe, that's what he's doing right here. This cowboy is saving this horse's life by spurring him and changing his direction. It's amazing. Now, it's only other people that need to be spurred and directed. I mean, I told you that not for you. That's for other people only. None of us here has ever surrendered to lethargy. None of us have ever been consumed by entropy or, or succumbed to uh, the phrase from Dr. Levin, a disordered passivity, right? No, it doesn't, doesn't apply to us. Therefore, since it doesn't apply to you, you won't mind taking my little survey. Look in your notes if you would. There's 11 questions there. I'd like you to borrow a pen from the lady next to you. And uh, the bottom of her purse has seven Frisco Bible pens. Borrow one. And, uh, and if you would, check, check any of these that are true of you. First question. I really don't want anyone to tell me that I need correction. Uh, oh, by the way, I don't have time to go into all these, but I... I put these scriptures in your notes for you. You can study this on your own. The Bible has a lot to say about every one of these questions. So, for example, in this one, Proverbs 1.7 gives a great answer to this issue. But for today, we're just going to, for right now, we're just going to deal with the issue. I really don't want anyone to tell me I need correction. Second question, I have not done good that I knew that I should do. I have repaid evil for evil. Yeah, same to you, buddy. Right? I get tired of encouraging other people. I sometimes talk about what needs to get done more than actually getting it done. Please just mark on your own paper. <laughs> I, I tend to think that good works are optional. I mean, that's really how I think. I, I, I believe they're good. I like to do nice deeds, but it's just op- if I feel like it. Um, I often let other activities replace church gatherings. I'm not always ready to share. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 tells us we should be always ready to share uh, both material and, and most especially immaterial uh, truth, but I'm, I'm not always ready. Um, I do not prioritize doing good to other Christians. Now, I, it's not that I don't do good to other Christians. If it happens to line up with my schedule, I'll do something nice, but I don't make a priority out of it. I'm sometimes lazy or sloppy in what I do. I rarely think about the return of Jesus. Okay. Now, the ideal number of check marks is zero, right? The ideal score is zero, that none of those are true. And Lord willing, that is where you and I are going to be at the end of this year. At the end of this year, that's where we're going to be. Amen? How many, and this is no trick, I'm just genuinely curious and it's wonderful. How many of you scored zero already today? None of those were true of you. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Good for you. Amen. You can put your hand down. I saw it. Um, now, <laughs> you may not need any spurring yourself, and that's wonderful, but guess what? We need you. We need you to spur us to stay engaged. So let's dive in to, to what we call God's action plan. Look at top the right side of our notes. We've already covered some of the context in Hebrews, but there's one more aspect I think we're going to find really useful. Um, the context contains three imperative Actions. They're presented in parallel. Uh, you see them here. Verse 22 has one, let us. Verse 23, let us. And verse 24, let us. And here's how they flesh out. 22 says, let us draw near. Let us draw near. Talking about the very presence of God. But we, because of what Jesus has done for us by God's grace through faith, we can draw near to the awesome wonder of God. Verse 23, second imperative, let us hold on without wavering. Hold on. Without wavering. And then verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on. All right. Now, I want to I show you something. I want to overlay something I think Frisco Bible people will recognize. Let us draw near. Verse 22 is imperative. That is the very pith of our annual vision from two years ago. Remember, our annual vision was wonder. 
We draw near to the awesome wonder of God, and we, and we see the wonder of his word and his works everywhere around us. And then our vision last year was really, verse 23 summarizes it beautifully, let us hold on without wavering. Our annual vision as a church was to be undaunted. And now this year we have verse 24. Let us consider how to spur one another on. And the word we're using is activate. It all works together. Listen, our call to activate, to spur each other, comes in a specific context. We do so in awe of God and his works. We do so undaunted, holding on ourselves to the God who holds on to us. Isn't that cool? We, we cannot effectively spur each other if we are not drawing near to God in wonder and holding on ourselves. That context established, then we get to our command, which is to consider one another. Anybody here really enjoy people watching? Raise your hand if you like spending some time just watching human beings going about their normal tasks. All right. Yeah, me too. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating, uh, uh, amazing thing. Now, I've thought about this a little bit, and I've found four motives as to why I people watch. Uh, you, you may have more. These are just what I've seen in me. Number one motive is to laugh at people. <laughs> That's not nice. I recognize that. I repent of that. I wish that weren't true, but it is such a temptation to look at human beings just to be amazed at how incredibly stupid they are, right? Second motive is to study them, uh, rather like animals, noting their, their tendencies, their reactions to stimuli. I shared this during the, the first worship service, and a young lady came up who lifeguarded all summer, and she showed me her phone. And she had particular people activities, and she had kept check marks all summer long watching <laughs> what people did. Now, there's some value in that. There really is, especially for a lifeguard, because you can see who's about to kill themselves. Um, but, but, but there's a problem. The problem is that you can easily demean in your mind human beings who are made in the very image of God. By the way, here's one thing I've noticed. I'll, I'll go into this second mode of people watching, especially when I'm feeling personal insecurity or I'm afraid. I need to study them so I can protect myself. I think that may make sense for you too. Uh, number three, to negatively compare myself. Uh, this happened most often in my youth. Uh, this is just, it's just the other side of the coin of number one. One is to laugh at other people. The other is to be shamed myself. It's the same nonsense of comparison. Now, the fourth motive for people watching is most rare, and that is to understand them in order to motivate them better toward love and good deeds and assembly and encouragement. We should study human beings, but not to criticize them, not to pigeonhole them. We consider, we think about other people in order to serve them better. Now, I know, I know that brings up a question that you are posing in your Yuval uh, Levin imitation. He's a very brilliant man. He speaks very quickly. How can we do that? Name one endeavor that specifically contributes to considering one another for the proper motive. Right? You thought I spoke quickly. Um, great question, Dr. Levin. Thank you so much. One endeavor that specifically will help you go to motive number four. Here it is. I've got an answer for that question, and the answer is why. Ask yourself why. If the honest answer isn't number four, then claim that, admit it, and beg God for forgiveness. As you study someone, ask yourself, why am I looking at that person? Is it to lust? Is it to laugh at them? Is it to seek a weakness? Or is it that I'm actually trying to get to know them so I can serve them better? If it's anything other than motive number four, go to God and beg forgiveness. When you study your friends or your spouse, and you should, Ask yourself, am I just watching her so I can criticize the way she's doing that? Am I, just, am I just studying him so that I can point out all the flaws in his reasoning or what he thinks is reasoning, right? Or, or am I actually watching and listening so I can help them be their best self? That's it. Ask yourself why. Every time we catch ourselves doing anything less than God's prescribed reason for considering others, we've got to repent of that. Some of us, I, I know some of you like to leave a Bible study with some very specific things to do during the next week. All right, well, here's one for you this week. Every time you observe a human being, ask yourself why. Why are you looking at her? Why are you looking at him? If you'll do that, over a relatively short period of time, I predict you will find yourself moving more and more and more toward number four, how to best motivate them toward love, good deeds, assembly, and encouragement. All God's people said.
Having considered, we move into the meat of the calling. God calls us to consider people and the times so that we can activate love, good deeds, assembling in church, and encouragement. Let's briefly consider those callings. Um, Love has fallen on hard times. Um, The word has been drained of all meaning. It usually gets trumped by hate. In fact, one of the major factors of our time, and it's been true of many times, but especially ours, is reactionary hatred. Reactionary hatred has become the norm in the world. It is no stranger to Christians. When I hear from other pastors, and, and I'm blessed to hear often, it doesn't matter whether they're in some other part of the world or somebody on our own staff, this is almost always one of their main problems. I'll just take one note. A uh, pastor said, this is my top pain, the way the brethren can turn very ugly very fast when their pet concern is not embraced. It really hurts. For example, another pastor recently sent me this letter. He said this, Wayne, a couple in our church have been our friends for years. We've shared very deeply together, laughed, cried together in small group. Last week they said that since I won't, and I'll use his quote, use the pulpit to point out the evil of the U.S. Democrat Party, that's what they wrote him, they are leaving the church. They even threatened to send a censure note to our small group because I refuse to call out evil. And here here he vents a little bit. Applying scripture, I speak against evil all the time, regardless of party. This is maddening and defeating. Please pray for me. How would you respond to that mess? Here's what I wrote. I said, sigh. I ache with you and I pray for you, brother. Now you know not to attack back, not even under the pretense of setting the record straight. It is amazing how much sin we commit under that banner, setting the record straight. But pray about them until you find you're praying for them in love. Only love can conquer reactionary hatred. 1 Peter 4.8 is still our rule even if all other brethren forget. Above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. In a world and even in churches consumed with reactionary hatred, love makes all the difference. Love people even as they stab you in the back. If nothing else, it will drive them crazy. That's the point in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, Paul says this, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, quote here from Deuteronomy 32, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. This is from Proverbs 25. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Wow. At least in my heart, love can overcome hatred. And evil can be conquered by doing good. Here, read it with me. Verse verse 21. Let's read it all together. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. There is undeniable evil at work in this world. And there is evil at work in our own selves, every one of us. Anyone who says otherwise is lying to you and probably trying to sell you something that is very bad for you. But that evil and all evil can be conquered by good deeds. I've lived long enough that I've seen it happen many times. Let me just tell you one story. One of the nastiest expressions of evil in my lifetime was practiced by actually a large government, the government of a country in East Germany, uh, the DDR. That oppressive government trapped and controlled its citizens. When I worked in the country called West Germany next door, we had refugees often from the east, and the stories were horrifying. The government killed Christians for sport. They, if you spoke, a Christian or not, if you spoke against the government, they had ways to make sure that you were marginalized until you starved to death. I never thought I would see It was just larger than life. I I just never, in my little faith, I never thought I'd see the DDR overthrown. And yet, Christians that I knew conquered that evil. I met so many Christians who were living in the East who just every day kept doing good. Seemingly tiny little ways. Year after year in the face of betrayal and persecution, they just did good. And eventually, God used their good deeds to overcome Love covers reactionary hatred. Good deeds conquer evil. And isolation is overcome by commitment to the assembly. Do you remember Dr. Levin's uh, summary of the recent research? He said, through social media, we display ourselves without really connecting. Many people have become functional loners. So I put a little time into a... um, 
and piloted it past some people, a little study to determine whether I have become a functional loner. Maybe you'd be brave enough to take this as well. Here's, these, here's the five questions that I came up with. Uh, answer yes or no to each of these if you're brave enough. I have ended a relationship because we disagreed on a cultural issue. Yes or no? I evaluate a church primarily on what I can get out of it. Yes or no, I have shared more deeply via, via social media than in private conversation about the same topic. It, it, to explain, there's a, there's a topic, some issue, and I've been in conversation with a real human being about that topic, okay? But I have also been on social media about that topic, and I have shared more deeply, emotionally, in, in social media than I did with the person. Question number four, I keep relationships distant enough that I can't get seriously wounded. Have a nice day. Um, Here's here's one that's really hard. Yes or no? I consider myself highly committed to the assembly, the assembly of the brethren, like we're told in Hebrews 10. If, and here's, here's my bar, this is the high bar to me. If I make my small group once a month and I make it to worship twice a month, that to me is very high commitment. All right? Folks, Don't lie to yourself. If we answer yes to any one of those, and many of us did, it indicates that at least to some degree we are functional loners. That's why God commanded us to spur each other to the assembly, to assembling with our brethren. Remember how Dr. Levin put it? He said, we we have to make a deeper, warmer argument, a case against giving up, to persuade human beings to overcome passivity and paralysis and jump into life. Amen? This is God's calling. To, to consider so we can activate love and good deeds and assembling and encouragement with each other. Think about encouragement for a moment. It is so important to human flourishing. You, you know, discouragement presses in on us all the time. But genuine encouragement lifts that burden. Look here. I want to show you something. Uh, speaking to uh, Ezekiel. Uh, God says the Lord exposes so brilliantly how discouragement is an intricate part of life. Everybody gets it backwards. Look what he says, Ezekiel chapter 13. You have discouraged the righteous. He's not talking about Ezekiel. He's talking about the leaders of the time. You have discouraged the righteous with your lies, but I didn't want them to be sad. And you've encouraged the wicked by promising them life, even though they continue in their sins, right? I read that verse and I imagine Instagram saying to Ezekiel, Hold my beer, right? I, folks, this is, this is not a new problem that began with modern media. False teachers to regular numbskulls, human beings naturally discourage goodness, and we give false hope to people caught up in sin. Oh, that's okay. It's just great the way you are. You don't need to change, right? The answer to that mess is genuine encouragement. Not old wives' tales like Ezekiel 13 that pretend that everybody's okay, but genuine courage that is based on the word and presence of the Lord. Like in Isaiah 35, encourage the exhausted, strengthen the feeble. Say to those with an anxious heart, take courage. Fear not. Behold, your God will come. All God's people said, reactionary hatred, evil, isolation, discouragement. These are all around us. These are within us. They cause pains that you and I carry with us every day. But God meets us in that pain. And he gives us this gift of a church, a gathering of people who are willing to consider us to apply the spurs to move us toward victory. So what do you need right now? Is it love? That's a very common need. Guess what? God's people around you, and I say this with confidence, wherever you are in the world, God's people around you have love to spare. You know why love is easy to spare? Because it's that rare commodity that grows when it's given away. What do you need? Are you you beaten down by evil? Let your brethren encourage you to do good, to light some candle in some small way or maybe some big way to light your candle against the darkness. Are Are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling alone? Listen, listen, it's a lie. Let us remind you that if you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus promised he is with you always to the end of the age. And by the way, we're here with you too. Now, you may not want us. Um, you can't choose your family, but, uh, but you, we, we are committed to growing up in Jesus together. Are you discouraged? Sure you are. Lots of times we're encouraged. 
Take encouragement. Take the encouragement of God that there is positive news. Listen, there is absolutely nothing crooked in this world that will not be made straight when Jesus returns. But if he tarries for the next year, we'll have time to fulfill this uh, annual vision, which is uh, to activate. Why do we need to do this? Look up here at our series premise. This is the why. Why are we studying this? Christians are called to be active people, ones who take on new adventures by embracing the continual process of growth in Christ. And yet, activation's always been a struggle for Christians because Satan, our own flawed flesh, and the world system work against our forward motion. Thus, you know what happens. Entire sections of life that should fruitfully flourish instead just lie fallow. What should be exciting explorations languish for lack of adventurers. That's the situation. There are mountains that you and I need to climb. There are great deeds that wait to be done. There is a world waiting to be changed by the gospel, but we first have to get off our easy chair and activate. Adam Ag, uh, this guy right here, and Ian Escalin, they, they wrote a song a few years ago for a band they had at the time called Stellar Cart. Um, the, yeah, I like Stellar Cart too. I agree. This poem, I think, really neatly captures our annual vision. Look what they wrote. They said, here's the plan. I think I got it made. Life's easy when you're sitting in the shade. Not too hot, not too cold. I think that's what I'll be. Now I'm nervous. And I've come undone. My head is spinning like the earth around the sun. I feel you drawing me away from my complacency. I think I'm ready to go. Don't stop till everybody knows. This is the purpose of my life. This is the reason I'm alive. Don't have time to wait. Activate, activate. There's a world out there in need. Now's the time for you and me before it gets too late. Activate, activate, make a move. Because talk is really cheap. You'll never start a revolution in your sleep. Showing love to everyone is what it's all about. One by one, everyone activate. Everyone activate, one by one. That, that's another way of stating our objective. Here's our objective for this series and for the whole year, that you and I spur each other on in Christ. Proverbs 27, 17 uh, captures this with a really cool image. Uh, read it with me. Proverbs 27, 17, all together, everybody. Iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens another. Iron sharpens iron. It isn't just about you. There's a generation out there waiting for people to sharpen them, to spark a revolution, a revolution of love and good deeds and assembly, meeting together of encouragement. Here, here just ask this guy. Uh, Professor James Hankins has been teaching at Harvard for 37 years. Uh, he has seen some things. And I want you to read what he said in a very recent interview. Uh, Dr. Hankins said this. The younger generation out there is disgusted with the older one. The people who get all the attention from the press are the woke, but there's another big part of the young population that's ready for a moral revolution. And it's not just in the U.S. He's traveled and taught in China and says it's happening there too, subterraneously. It's building. Now is the time for Christians to get active. Look at our theme. Here's our theme for this series. We are called to propel each other forward in Christ. Specifically, Hebrews 10 tells us to put considerable thought into proxismos, a term which in that context means to stimulate, to sharpen, to spur this is a strong calling, but a, but a positive one. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 declares that in this catalytic work, we must spur each other to four things. Say them with me, everybody. Love, good deeds, assembling together, and encouragement. Dan Cox, one of the elders at this church, recently wrote a, a absolutely brilliant note to our elders. He said this. He said, a wise businessman taught me everything is a process. We must build the right processes in ourselves, performing the little things that add up to great results. We should also motivate our brethren to achieve God's great vision for us by doing the right things every day. In God's Old Testament phrase, we must keep urging each other to break up unplowed ground and keep forging ahead. Amen. Now, another one of our elders, in response, sent this comment to me. He said, we don't need mere information. We need constant motivation. Now, by the way, that elder claims that he is absolutely did not mean to use, ab, to use perfect meter and rhyme. But I think he's a secret rap artist. Um, I mean, that is absolutely perfect. It's incredible. And seriously, he is right. He is right. We need continuous spurring. So do our brethren. So does the world that is ready for the kind of courage that only we can spark. Let me close with this. I want to give you a visual reminder of just how powerful it can be when spurring is done in the right way. When it is done in the right way, it, it's like lightning striking. Take a look. Jason gets the rail run and they're into the stretch. And it's Messier from Pride. This epicenter is coming up on the outside. Epicenter has taken the lead as they arrive into the final for one. Jason is coming after him. Epicenter and Jason. Coming up on the inside! Oh my goodness! 
I have chills. And folks, that's us after this year. And in the coming days, we're going to get into the specifics of, of how we make those changes, how we practically fulfill the, the Hebrews 10 vision. For now, for now, I encourage us just to do this today. Commit to the process. Commit to embrace all the little things that add up to make all the difference. In your own style, as guided by the Holy Spirit, commit to being an activator for positive change. Will you do that? Let's pray to that end. Pray with me. Father, I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I ask you that you will use us, change us. Let us be great spurs of love and good deeds and the assembly and encouragement. And, and let us be good receivers <laughs> of paroxysmos as well. In Jesus' name, amen.